Hey, friendly neighborhood immunologist here, and today we're going to talk about prion disease. Prion diseases are terrifying to me as an immunologist because the immune system can't do much about it. Typically, the immune system can help with anything. Uh, thankfully, prion diseases are rather rare. In fact, in the 1970s, only a hundred or so people died per year of prion disease. Fast forward to 2022, and it's closer to 500 people. So thankfully, it's incredibly rare, but it is increasing. So today I'm going to tell you um, what are the top three most likely ways a person can get prion disease, what actually is prion disease, and then what is the role of the immune system. So let's get started. All right, so let's talk about prion proteins. Here you can see three different prion proteins, and one of them is going to misfold. The misfolded state could be due to genetics or potentially eating infected meat. So what happens next is the misfolded prion protein can now cause any normal healthy prion protein to misfold. And now there's twice as many misfolded prion proteins. So you're starting to see how dangerous it is. Any misfolded prion protein can cause a normal healthy prion protein to misfold. And so as the disease progresses, there's more and more misfolded prion protein, which can damage and destroy cells. All right. So what are the top three ways that a person could get prion protein disease? Number one is genetics. Genetics actually only accounts for 10 to 15% of people who are diagnosed with prion disease. Number two is eating infected meat. Now the most well-known case is mad cow disease. Specifically in the UK, people were consuming beef, which isn't a problem, except that these cows had been fed ground up other cows containing brain and spinal cord, and animals should never eat the brain and spinal cord of their own species. All right, I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. Number three is sporadic. This is actually the largest cause of prion protein disease. And unfortunately, it means we don't understand why it's happening. All right, so let's orient to this picture. I'm gonna show you where prion proteins go. Uh, so here off to the side, we have a lymph node. And in the lymph node are these circles of cells. These cells can either be uh, in orange, B cells, or in blue, T cells. Now, next to them are these purple cells, which I'm gonna tell you all about. They're called dendritic cells. These are all cells of the immune system. B and T cells live for a very long time, and dendritic cells live between like weeks and months. And they're all in lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are located throughout your body, specifically like the base of your neck, armpits, behind your knees, and you have about 700 of them. All right, so why does it matter? Because if you consume a prion protein, or if you happen to have a misfolded prion protein sporadically, they will circulate throughout your body because they're hard to destroy. So here, I'm gonna draw them in these little butterfly shapes, sort of the way I had folded them before. Now, outside of this dendritic cell are misfolded prion proteins. There we go. And when the dendritic cell encounters these misfolded proteins, it's going to consume them. The process is called phagocytosis or cell eating. And as it brings the prions into the cell body, it puts it in this circle. The circle is called a vesicle. And that means it's now gained access to the inside of the dendritic cell. It's going to try and fight it off though. So what they can do is typically if a dendritic cell or most immune cells, when they eat something through phagocytosis, they try and destroy it with acid and enzymes, which typically works. Uh, the acidic part is called the lysosome, lysosome. The pH here is about that of your stomach, maybe even a little bit lower, like a pH between one and two. So typically it'll break proteins down. However, unfortunately, prions are resistant to this process. So um, it's unsuccessful and the dendritic cell is still full of prions. Now what happens next? There are other options. One other thing that the dendritic cell could try to do is to break down the prion proteins through another classic cellular mechanism called the proteasome ubiquitin pathway. 
they basically tag misfolded proteins because your cell gets misfolded proteins fairly often. So they're tagged with ubiquitin. And then it's basically like putting a little red flag on them. And then they're taken to the proteasome, which is the scissors. They're like scissors within the cell to cut up misfolded proteins. However, prion proteins are also resistant to the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So now, unfortunately, the misfolded proteins will eventually get free from the vesicles and interact with healthy dendritic prion proteins. And it's going to happen like in the previous video. Now, this healthy prion protein misfolds. It's going to interact with a nearby healthy prion protein and cause it to misfold. And this terrible cascade, this terrible uh, relay race, is going to cause all of the prion proteins within this dendritic cell to misfold. And this is why it can take such a long time for a person to experience the effects from prion disease. Typically, it could take up to 20 years for a person to realize that they have prion disease. Uh, and the reason is because the prions have to make it all the way to a lymph node, be consumed by a dendritic cell, and then the dendritic cell has to travel across a series of lymph nodes, depending on how far away it is from the blood-brain barrier. Because that's why people who have prion disease experience terrible symptoms, such as dementia and the loss of brain cells, because dendritic cells are going to carry the prion protein across the blood-brain barrier. If they weren't hiding inside of immune cells like dendritic cells, um, there is some evidence that prion proteins could be prevented or stopped. So yeah, the dendritic cell is going to cross the blood-brain barrier because immune cells are capable of doing that after a certain amount of activation and traveling throughout the system of lymph nodes in our body. So what I'm drawing here is a, um, as a neuron, just to sort of indicate that once the dendritic cell crosses the blood-brain barrier, they're able to access neurons of the brain, damage and destroy them leading to those terrible dementia symptoms. All right, so here's the third piece of the puzzle. We are now inside the brain, and you can see here the dendritic cell has made it, and it's going to interact with a neuron. So the thing about prion proteins is it is the highest concentrated in the brain and spinal cord, and the third most concentrated part in your body is the lymph nodes. So here is that prion-infected dendritic cell. It took potentially months to years for it to cross the blood-brain barrier, but it's made it to the brain and it's now going to spread these misfolded proteins to the neuron. The neuron will pick up the misfolded proteins and then all of the prion proteins inside the neuron will become damaged. In fact, it's thought that normal healthy prion proteins are very important to neurons. They can be at the synapses where neurons communicate to one another. Potentially, they're also important for cell signaling or support or scaffolding. All right, so here we go. Prion proteins are really concentrated in the brain. So when an infected misfolded dendritic cell brings the misfolded proteins, it's going to infect the neurons. But then potentially immune cells are actually going to cause additional inflammation. There's some studies done in prion disease in rodents indicating that the immune cells of the brain, microglia seen here, play a role. This is a normal, healthy microglia. When they have these long, beautiful branches, they are in a resting state in the brain and are typically just surveying the environment and supporting the neuron's health. However, when misfolded proteins are around or when neurons are damaged, they turn into this blobby, it's called amoeboid, uh, shape. And now this is an activated microglia. Activated microglia are going to produce cytokines. Almost always cytokines are drawn as, as circles in textbooks and, and uh, published articles online. So these are inflammatory cytokines from microglia. So this is another potential avenue um, that researchers are looking at to improve prion disease because microglia do make neurotoxic cytokines. I'm going to go ahead and list some of the top neurotoxic cytokines, other potential uh, treatment mechanisms in just a minute. 
But yeah, the reason why people should never ever eat brains or spinal cord of anyone, especially not their own species, is because the highest concentration of prion proteins is in the brain and spinal cord, followed by the lymph nodes. All right, so here are some neurotoxic cytokines. Microglia can produce TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and I'm off the page, so I'm going to fix that. IL-6 is C. These three cytokines can directly and indirectly kill neurons. So there's some debate as to whether the prion proteins themselves can be neurotoxic or whether or not it requires participation from the immune cells as microglia. All right, so to sum up, prions are normal proteins in most mammals concentrated in the brain and spinal cord. The majority of the time when prions become disease-related, it's due to something sporadic, meaning that doctors and researchers don't always know the case. However, sometimes it has to do with eating infected meat, eating infected meat, because the brain and spinal cord are so rich in prion protein. If you happen to consume it from another animal's brain and spinal cord, you could potentially get uh, the mutated prion, which then over time could traffic from your intestines to your lymph node, replicate in your lymph node's dendritic cells, and over the course of years, gain access to your blood-brain barrier, and then destroy your neurons, which results in the dementia symptoms in people who have prion disease. All right, so remember, 15% of the time it's genetic, meaning that some people have altered prion codes in their genetics, and when they're translated to a protein in the brain, they start to misfold on their own. So only 15% of the time, prions are genetically um, at fault there, and 85% of the time, it's sporadic, meaning we don't understand exactly how it's happening, and then a subset of those are due to infection. So the top two ways to get prion disease are family history, as well as eating infected meat, and then the third is sporadic. So we don't fully understand how prion disease occurs in these sporadic people. Now, most of the time, it's called kurtzfeld jakob disease. There are six different subtypes. If we're talking about the people who ate infected meat, so for example, if somebody died from mad cow disease, uh, the doctor would say that they died from variant kurtzfeld jakob disease. All right, so now you know a bit more about it. There have been some studies in rodents showing that if the lymph nodes are removed, particularly the lymph nodes nearest to the blood-brain barrier, that the prions never gain access to the blood-brain barrier. So there is a lot of research being done to fully understand prion disease. Um, where I worked before this, I worked next door to a prion lab. Um, so I know that there is active research being done into how to improve the lives and eventually cure the people who have prion disease. It would be really interesting to see if you know, you found out you were infected or you had meat, and then people could potentially undergo some type of a, a surgery to remove their lymph nodes, like they do in breast cancer or various other types of cancer. Maybe that's a way to stop the immune cells from trafficking into the blood-brain barrier and damaging neurons. I'm not sure. I just wanted to end on a slightly more hopeful note. But I hope you know more about prion disease now. It is good to be back and making videos, and I hope you're all having a healthy new year.